We are going to turn now to God's Word. And I want to start by asking you this question. What is your goal? What's your goal? When Arnold Schwarzenegger was 11 years old, he was growing up in Austria, and he uh, didn't want to be in Austria, he said. He, he had seen videos and movies, shows. He watched this documentary at school about the United States, and he thought, yes, that's where I want to be. And one day, he, on his way home from school, he stopped at this uh, grocery store, supermarket, and he was looking to the magazines, and he saw this magazine, and on the cover of it was this man by the name of Reg Park. Reg Park was three-time winner of the Mr. Universe contest. And he, Arnold just couldn't believe this, how, how strong this man was. And he read the article, and I just want to read this for you. He said, wow, that's the blueprint for my life. This is exactly what I want to do. Nine years later, Arnold Schwarzenegger became the youngest, at 20 years old, youngest Mr. Universe winner. The reason I share that story is because, as you know, Arnold and I share a lot of things in common, our workout goals, our training. Okay, none of that's true. The reason I share it is because Arnold had this goal of what he wanted to do, what he wanted to become, and he saw this man's life as a blueprint for him. If I just follow all these things that he did, then I could become Mr. Universe 2. What's your goal? We all have all sorts of different goals. Maybe you have some, uh, maybe you have a weight loss goal, or maybe you have a workout goal. Maybe you have a, a goal for your garden or for your career. Maybe you have some parenting goals. I want my kids to learn this or these things. Maybe you have some education goals. I want to get these grades so I can get into this university so I can get to this career. Maybe that's part of your goal. Maybe you do have other career goals. I want to I be making this much or work at, at this uh, company, this organization. Those are my goals. Uh, maybe you have video game goals. I want to be the fastest, the best Minecraft player in the whole world, and everyone's going to know my name. We have all sorts of different goals. Maybe some of you are saying, I don't have any goals. And I'd say, that's probably your goal. You probably are very conscious. You make an effort to not have any goals. I'm just going to roll with the punches. I'm just going to go with the flow. And you make a goal out of just being low stress and taking everything easy and just seeing how things unfold for you. Here's one more question. What's your goal for your Christian faith? What's your goal this month, this week, this year during your lifetime for your Christian faith? My guess is you probably don't have one. It reminds me a lot of this guy. Do you remember this guy? I wanted to show a picture uh, of him for you. This is Tom Hanks in the movie, movie Forrest Gump. And if you look at this picture, look at his shoes. You know, these white sneakers just covered in mud. And that comes from a, a scene, or that, that's kind of pointing us to a part in the movie. Maybe you remember the phrase, run, Forrest, run. Well, one morning, Forrest Gump wakes up, and he's sitting on his front porch, and he said that he just felt like running. So he runs to the end of the street. When he gets to the end of the street, he says he felt like he, to, just to keep running. And so he ran uh, across town. Then he runs across the county. Then he runs across the state. Then he just keeps on running till he gets to the ocean. And when he gets there, he just turns around and keeps on running. For three years, and I forget what the number is, two months, 16 days, and 12 hours, Forrest Gump just runs. And then one day, in the middle of it all, he just says, I'm tired. I think I'm going to go home now. All that time, all that running with no goal in sight at all, no plan of what he was hoping to achieve, just he just went for a run, and it just kept on going and going and going. That reminds me of a lot of Christians. I think a lot of Christians don't have a goal when they set out. They just uh, believe in Jesus, and so they start doing these things. They go to church, or they read their Bible, or they say their prayers, and, and all of those things are great things. But there's kind of not a goal that they're working towards. And at some point, a lot of Christians stop and say, I'm tired. I think I'm just going to sleep in this Sunday. I think I'm just going to stop going to church. I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere in my faith. I don't feel like anything's changing. And a major reason for that is that they had no goal. They hadn't set their sights on anything at all. What is the goal of your Christian faith? 
I think some people might say, well, the goal of my Christian faith is to get to heaven. And that's a great goal. I hope that you do. I hope that we all see each other there and that we bring a lot of people with us. The goal of getting to heaven is a great goal, except think about this for a moment. Who does all the work to get you to heaven? Jesus is the one who comes from heaven to earth. He's the one who lives a perfect life. He's the one who dies on the cross. He's the one who rises again. He's the one who sends the Holy Spirit. Uh, You're baptized into his name. He's the one who seals you, the Holy Spirit, for your inheritance in heaven, which is guaranteed and promised for you. Your part is really just to continue believing until you die. It's a great goal. I hope we all get there. But, If it's someone's goal, it seems actually more like it's Jesus' goal. He's the one who said, I came to seek and to save the lost. And our part in it is just to continue believing in him. Other people might say the goal is to uh, bring other people to faith. Again, I love that goal. I think that's a super great goal. But think about that as well. If you bring people to faith, I mean, you're out there sharing your faith. You're telling people about Jesus. you're, You're praying for people. But in the end, you have zero control over whether someone comes to the faith. It's really, again, up to God. It's up to the Holy Spirit working in them. And so even though that's a great goal, and I hope that we do share our faith, in fact, I think that we're commanded to do that, we don't have a lot of control over that goal. So what's the goal? I mean, some of you uh, would say it's getting to heaven. Some of you would say, well, it's uh, making sure other people um, get to heaven and maybe you practice in front of the mirror what you would say. You know, if you were to die tonight, where would you be going? Sometimes I thought the answer to that question is, oh, if I died tonight, I was probably making a late night trip to KFC. That's probably where I was going. But that's, I don't think, the intention of the question. We don't get ourselves to heaven. Jesus is so pivotal in that. Without him, it's hopeless. We don't bring other people to faith without the Holy Spirit. We can't do it at all. It's hopeless. What is the goal of our Christian faith? I think that it's God's goal that we look more and more like Jesus. That day after day after day, we grow in Christ-likeness. Let me read this for you from Romans chapter 8. And we know... That for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. That's God's goal for us. That we might be conformed to the image of his son. That we look more and more like Jesus. And that goal makes total sense if you think about who God is and who he created us to be. We're told back in Genesis that God makes us in his image. And the Hebrew word there doesn't just mean that we would physically look like uh, God. But it tells us that we were made in his image to, to resemble him in our character and be his representatives in the world. That we would not only look like him, but that we would mirror him, that we would reflect him, that we would share him with the world around us. And so that's exactly who Adam and Eve were, but once they sinned, that image is broken. And so it would make perfect sense for God to want us to get back to more of that, to get back to being more like his character, to get back to being more like Jesus, because that's who he created us to be in the first place his children, who look and act and sound and talk a lot like he does as we share his love with the world. In that sense, Jesus is our Mr. Universe. In that sense, Jesus is our blueprint of what a Christian life should look like. He's the one that we should be following, modeling our lives after. If you've ever built something following instructions, though it's no good just to know that there are instructions— or to have uh, seen the instructions or heard about the instructions, you actually need to follow the instructions. Otherwise, the Lego you're building or the house that you're constructing won't turn out the way that it's supposed to. We're supposed to follow Jesus, and there's a lot of Bible verses that tell us that. Let me read just a few of them for you. They'll be up on the screen for you. In Matthew 16, 24, it says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. John 13, 15 says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul writes, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And in 1 John 2, 6, it says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And there's more verses that say the same thing. The goal for Christians is to live a life like Jesus. Our lives are not going to be perfect. I'm not saying that they can be. I'm not expecting that you're going to die on the cross to save the world from its sin. But in the things that Jesus did and the ways that he behaved and the actions that he took, he's actually the blueprint for the Christian life. The goal of a Christian life isn't just to uh, listen to a sermon once a week. or It's not to uh, pray occasionally. It's not to go to church once in a while. It's not to memorize the Lord's Prayer. It's to become more and more like Jesus. So over the coming weeks, over the season of Lent, we're going to be talking about spiritual disciplines. These are things that Jesus seemed to be in the habit, the rhythm, the routine of doing, and that it makes sense that we should then be in the habit and routine and discipline of doing as well. Before we go any further, though, I want to tell you something right now. This is not a to-do list. Spiritual disciplines aren't a to-do list. Jesus said this. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Those are such great words. I'm sure you've heard them before. I want to say them once more. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus knows something about you. He knows that you're already weary and burdened. He knows you don't need another to-do list, another bunch of things to put on your shoulders and to burden you with. These disciplines aren't a to-do list. They're a way to freedom and peace and Christ-likeness. I want to read a quote for you. It's from a guy named Richard Foster, and he wrote this. We click through an endless stream of internet links, write daily blogs, read tweets from God knows who, check our emails constantly, text family and others, and mindlessly scroll through Facebook. We are bombarded by broad distractions of constant noise, constant demands, constant news. Everyone, it seems, wants us to be accessible 24-7 and to respond instantly to any and every request. We, of course, complain endlessly about our wild world, but let's be honest, we do enjoy our technological gluttony. I'm sure some of you can relate to that. I mean, how many of you have spent hours just scrolling through the TV, through maybe your, your subscription, or maybe to Netflix, or maybe to Prime, or maybe to Disney? You've scrolled for hours, and in the end, just watched 20 minutes or something before you said, man, I don't want to watch that. But instead of walking away, you start scrolling again, or you've scrolled through Facebook hour after hour, reading all these little posts and seeing pictures of what so-and-so cooked last night, and yada, yada, a link they shared, and you don't even know half these people. I mean, who is, who is that again? Someone's mom is sick. Do you know them? I have no idea who they are, but we keep on scrolling endlessly. We keep checking our phones. What's the update? What's the news? What's the weather? What's the weather here? What's the weather in Alabama? What's the weather going to be like in Texas? Are you going to Texas? No, never. But we keep scrolling through all this information that's accessible to us. And we're worn out and we're exhausted, but we're addicted to it. And so we keep on flipping through the blue screen looking for something else to look at. Jesus offers us something so different than that. Jesus offers us rest. Let me read what he says next. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. To take up someone's yoke means to take on their teachings, take on what they have been um, uh, showing you, not only in their words, but also by their example, by the things that they have done. Jesus says, take my teachings, what I've said and what I'm doing, take that on to yourself as well. I'm gentle. I'm not a taskmaster. I'm not shaking my fist at you. I'm not shouting and screaming at you and holding a whip to keep you going. I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. 
When's the last time you just clapped on your couch and just said, oh, my feet are so tired, or oh, I'm too tired to even go to sleep. Have you said that lately? What does that even mean? I'm too tired to go to sleep. Jesus says you're going to find rest, not just for your aching feet or your weary mind, but for your, your soul, the very core of who you are. I love how he ends this. He says these words, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke, the teaching, the lifestyle of Jesus is easy. Have you ever described the Christian life that way? Tell me about the Christian faith. Tell me about the Christian life. Oh, it's easy. It's easy. The burden is light. It's so easy. I don't know if you describe it that way or not. The yoke is easy and the burden is light. As you think about the ministry of Jesus, here's something interesting to think about. How often did he give people more rules to follow? Did he do that a lot or did he more often give people grace to live in? Jesus doesn't give a long list of rules. In fact, often when he talks about rules, he talks about how they're not working. You know that rule you have? All these rules of the Pharisees? Woe to you, you're saying this, but you're not actually doing it. You're not actually following it. Not the way that God would want you to. He knew that the people that he was speaking to in that time didn't need any more rules. And he knows that you don't need any more rules either. I mean, we've got a lot of rules in our society. We have rules about all sorts of things. Do this, think this, say this, behave like this, listen to this kind of music. Justin Bieber, you're not, you have to make fun of him in public, but you can listen to him at home. That's fine. Uh, Do these things, eat these foods, uh, wear these socks, uh, but don't wear them with sandals. I mean, there's all sorts of rules that we have that are imposed. And I mean, think about it today. The rules are so visible today. Wear this three-layer mask everywhere you go. How's that for a rule? Always stand six feet apart from everyone else. That's a pretty visible rule, isn't it? You can only visit with these people that are in your household. Unless you're single, then you can can go visit someone else, but only one other person. I mean, we have all these rules. You can go for a walk, but don't stand too close to them. Make sure you're wearing your mask. We have all these rules, and I, I hear so often people saying, I'm just so sick of it. I'm just so tired of it. All these rules that we're already burdened and carrying. Jesus says, I've got something different for you. I've got rest for your souls. The truth is, we like some of the burden that we've picked up. We've gotten used to it. Often we brag about it. Oh, I'm so busy. I'm so swamped. Oh, I didn't sleep at all last night. I was thinking about work or whatever it is. We like some of this burden that we've picked up because we've gotten used to it. We've chosen all sorts of other things over Jesus. We choose to binge watch TVs over spending time, uh, TV shows over spending time with Jesus. Uh, We choose our careers over Jesus. We choose hockey or running or Facebook or yard work or, or gardening or comfort and a whole list of other things over Jesus as well. We just have, and that's the reality of sin, that always puts a barrier between us and God, and we see the barrier. We see some other thing, some distraction, and instead of spending that time with Jesus, we say, oh, you know what, I think I'm just going to, I think it'd be easier. I think what I need is to watch this show instead. How many of us have said, oh, I'd like to pray more, but I'm just not a very good prayer. Or I'd like to read the Bible more, but, you know, honestly, I find it a little bit boring sometimes, and I'm not really sure what it's, uh, what it's saying to me. Think about all the time you've scrolled through uh, Netflix, or all the time you've scrolled through your phone looking for something, You didn't leave fulfilled, but you did it uh, 10 minutes later or the next day again anyway. Imagine if we took all that scroll time and actually put that much energy into our prayer lives. Or if we took that much energy and put it into reading the Bible, that much energy into worshiping. I mean, could you imagine how good we would be getting at those things? Maybe you've heard about the 10,000 hour rule. If you practice anything for 10,000 hours, you'll just be incredibly successful at it. But it takes that kind of energy and effort. What if we were determined to learn how to pray? What if we were determined to 
get more out of our time in the Bible? What if we were determined just to spend more time with Jesus and whether, whether we walk away every time saying, oh, that was so great or not, we would just know that we are growing in Christ-likeness. I have some good news for you because the reality is God wants that even more than you do. God wants you to succeed even more than you do, to, to spend a time in prayer even more than you do. He is so eager to hear from you and to speak to you. God wants you to uh, engage with his word even more than you do. If you feel that nudge like, oh, I should read my Bible, God is up in heaven saying, read the Bible, read the Bible, come hear what I have to say to you today. And the great news about these spiritual disciplines, trying to do these things more, is when we fail, there's forgiveness. God's compassion is new for us every single day. His power is made perfect in weakness. The best thing about all these things is that God wants them just as much and even more than you do. Do you remember the story of Zacchaeus? I won't read the whole story for you, but Zacchaeus, the wee little man who uh, wants to see the Lord, so he climbs the sycamore fig tree. Let me read part of this story for you. It says this, he, Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I was reading a book this week. I, I can't remember what the book was, but it pointed out the effort that Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus puts into this. I mean, first he has the desire to see Jesus. Then there's this obstacle, this crowd of people. So then he comes up with this plan. He anticipates where Jesus is going. I think he must be heading that way. He runs that way, climbs up to the top of the tree. He's dangling out of the top of this sycamore fig tree, just hoping to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And it turns into so much more. Jesus stops, calls him by name, and spends some time with him. And Zacchaeus, we didn't get to this part of the story, but he's changed because of it. Church, what if we started to anticipate the places that Jesus was going to be and put some energy into meeting him there? We know the places where Jesus is going to be. We know that when we pray that he hears and answers us. We, we know that if we put some energy into our prayer lives that he will meet us there and transform us. And we know that Jesus will meet us in his word, that the Holy Spirit will speak through his word and will receive Jesus there. We can anticipate he'll be there time and time again. So what if we put some energy into uh, meeting Jesus there? Jesus talks about fasting. What if we fast? I mean, could you imagine actually skipping a meal? What might God do for us in that? Uh, Jesus uh, again and again goes to worship. What if we change our focus in worship and just really said, I I'm not leaving until I've encountered and met Jesus there. And we started practicing how we worshiped. Here's a, a quick exercise I want you to do. I, I should have told you to grab a pen and paper. You know, grab your phone, grab a piece of pen and paper. Here's a quick exercise I'd like you to do. I'd like you to think of a goal for your faith. What's one area, maybe just during the season of Lent, what's one area in your life where you'd like to become more like Christ? A study was done. I just heard about it this week. A study was done and they... Uh, gave 900 people the same goal, and then tracked how long they made it. Do you want to know when most people quit their goal? It was day two. Most people gave up on day two. Why? Because day one was easy. They just had to get the instructions about the goal. But day two, when they actually had to implement it, that's when everyone was like, oh, forget it. This is going to be so hard to do. I want you to write down your goal because that's the number one way you can improve your chances of actually following through on it. Another way to improve your chances is after you've written it down, tell someone. Tell someone because then you've kind of made this spoken commitment to it and someone else knows about it. Someone else can not only hold you accountable and say, hey, how are you doing with that goal? But then they can also say, I think I can help you with that. You know, I've got this book or I read this thing or I saw this TED Talk or, or I know this person. I, I mean, they'll become a cheering section for you. What? area? What's your goal to become more like Christ? Maybe just in these next 40 days. I encourage you to write it down. 
to tell somebody and then start coming up with the steps. This is what it would take to get there to grow in my prayer life, to grow in fasting, to grow in worship, to grow in, in quiet and solitude. That's something Jesus did often as well. And start moving towards your goal. That's your homework for this week. I want to tell you, church, that you are loved by God. He made you in His image, and it would bring Him incredible joy to spend more time with you and to see you become more and more like Jesus. As you do that, you will also find freedom and joy, and rest for your souls. Amen. Let's pray together. God, I give you thanks for today. I give you thanks for your word that's living and active. I give you thanks that your mercy is new for us every morning, your compassion, and that, that as we follow you, that we know that you, Jesus, are the blueprint of what it looks like to live a God-pleasing life, a life that's passionately pursuing faithfulness. So Lord, I just ask that you would give us um, energy and excitement about the possibility of spending more time with you. Lord, and that you'd set us free in this process, that we'd find freedom and rest for our souls as we do that. Lord, I pray for each person listening that they would, that you'd call the mind for them a goal, one area. Um, it could just be something so small, one just step they can take, a baby step and growing more like you and spending more time with you. Lord, for everything else in our hearts and minds today, we commit those things to you, knowing that you're good, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you love us, knowing that you have the power to answer us, and knowing that by the Holy Spirit, you have the power to transform us and the situations we're facing. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want to take this opportunity uh, to quickly confess our sins together and hear God's words of forgiveness before we sing our closing song together. Let's speak these words of confession together. Lord God, we confess that living like Jesus has not been our highest priority. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your unfailing love. Wash away our indifference, our sinful desires, and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and make us more like your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Church, God has heard your confession and He forgives you. His grace is sufficient for you. His compassion is new for you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, may He enable you to become more and more like His Son, Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for joining me this morning. Just a reminder, we're going to be celebrating communion from 11 o'clock to 12. You're welcome to come down and join us for that. Receive a blessing from the Lord. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's sing this.